When you have a patient who is receiving a continuous infusion of a paralytic, there are some important things to be monitoring to ensure appropriate therapy is being delivered and to reduce patient harm. One of these is the train of four, which we'll discuss in this lesson here. All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and my goal is to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by making these complex critical care subjects easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that, and if I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications so you never miss out when I release a new lesson. As always, the notes for this lesson as well as all the previous videos are available exclusively to the YouTube and Patreon members. You can find links to join both of those down in the lesson description below. Also, don't forget to head over to icuadvantage.com or follow that link down in the lesson description to take a quiz on this lesson, test your knowledge while also being entered into a weekly gift card. As well as don't forget that you can help support this channel through the purchase of an ICU Advantage sticker. Uh, again, those are found at the website icuadvantage.com forward slash support link down in the description. So for this lesson, let's just jump right in and begin talking about what is peripheral nerve stimulation. So peripheral nerve stimulation is just what the name suggests. We are stimulating a peripheral nerve and we do this with an electrical stimulation. We place electrodes in specific locations to apply electrical stimulation directly to a specific nerve. By stimulating this nerve, we can actually induce muscle contraction. The electrical stimulation that we give actually causes depolarization of the nerve Nerves, causing them to send a signal onward to stimulate contraction of the target muscle. It is important to ensure that we are stimulating the nerve as we can also induce muscle contraction by directly stimulating the muscle itself. In just a bit, I will discuss this more as well as how to tell if this is actually the case. And so knowing all this, we can then apply this electrical stimulation and then evaluate muscle contraction. The end result is an objective way to measure neuromuscular function. So you might have the question of why do we even use use peripheral nerve stimulation. And essentially the reason that we use this is for, as I had just mentioned, for us to have an objective measure to be able to assess neuromuscular transmission in patients that have active neuromuscular blocker agents at work. So our paralytics. Basically, we can assess how much or how little of the paralysis is being achieved at our current medication dose level. To kind of understand how it is that all this works, I want to quickly go over some pathophysiology. And just as a quick review, if you recall, we have the neuromuscular junction where the nerve cell meets the muscle. We have the end of the axon of the presynaptic neuron, and this is the axon terminal forming the terminus button here. We then have the motor end plate on the muscle here where the signal from the nerve is received. Now when a depolarization signal comes through the axon, it actually releases the neurotransmitter acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft here, which then binds to these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. It's these receptors that are actually the ones that are blocked with our neuromuscular blocking agents. And really depending on the dose, not all these receptors are gonna be blocked and are still gonna be available for activation by acetylcholine. Now, when these receptors are activated on the motor end plate, the muscle depolarizes, causes contraction. And the force of this contraction is really dependent on the number of receptors that are activated. Thus, the more that are activated, the more muscle fibers are involved and the stronger the contraction we get. Now, when a patient has received a paralytic, we can assess how much blockage is taking place by delivering our own electrical stimulus. Now, we're typically only gonna be using this for patients who are receiving continuous infusion, and we need to really monitor the level of blockage that we have achieved. And we want to ensure that we do have enough blockage, but at the same time, to also assess and make sure that we don't have too much blockage. In fact, prolonged or excessive paralysis can actually lead to muscle weakness, something that we refer to as ICU neuropathy. And this can lead to very long recovery time for our patients afterwards. Now, by using the peripheral nerve stimulator, we can actually ensure that we are using the least amount of medication that's needed to achieve our purpose and can actually lead to quicker recovery of neuromuscular function once we actually discontinue it. 
So moving on from here, we're left with the question of what is train of four? And the most common type of peripheral nerve stimulation that we're going to be using is something that we call train of four or often abbreviated TOF. Now this assessment actually utilizes a device capable of delivering a series of four electrical stimulations in a row, hence the name train of four. The four stimulations occur fairly rapidly over about a second and a half or about a half a second between each one. And each stimulus is just 0.2 millisecond pulse. Now, based on these four stimulations, we can assess each of these stimulations and determine our patient's response to it. And I will actually be talking about this more in just a minute here. Typically on this box, there's a single button that when we press it, it delivers the train of four stimulations. Now, there are often other buttons for other types of stimulation, but I'm not actually going to be discussing those here. There also is often an LED that indicates when the stimulation is being applied, which can really help to guide your assessment on your patient's response. Now there's also a dial or some way for you to change the output of the device, which is usually in the range of 0 to 80 milliamps of current. So when it comes to doing our train of four assessment of our peripheral nerve stimulation, there's actually a few different sites that we can use for the stimulation. So the first site here, and this is actually the recommended site, this is going to be our ulnar nerve. And so as you can see here, the ulnar nerve runs along the underside of the patient's forearm through the wrist on the pinky finger side. It actually does branch and we have some of them running up to the ring and pinky finger, but then the main bit of the branch actually goes over towards the thumb. And the target muscle that we're looking for by stimulating this nerve is actually the adductor pollicis muscle. And the reason for this is this muscle is only innervated by the ulnar nerve. And this actually causes contraction of the base of the thumb bringing the thumb in towards the fingers. And the reason we want to assess this muscle response is this ensures that it's actually nerve stimulation that we're sending and not muscle stimulation. Because if we have our stimulation in the wrong location, we can actually do direct muscle stimulation and see the twitching of the ring and pinky finger as opposed to getting the actual nerve stimulation. The chance of this happening on the thumb with this location is significantly decreased. Therefore, if we see that twitching, we know it's the result of stimulating the nerve. Now when it comes to our electrode placement for this stimulation, we're going to place the distal lead, which is going to be the black negative one, directly over the nerve at the crease of the wrist. Then we're going to place the proximal lead, which is going to be our red positive, and this should be placed slightly off to the inside of the ulnar nerve, about two centimeters or more proximal to the distal lead. So the next nerve that we can use is actually going to be our facial nerve, and the facial nerve is actually cranial nerve 7. So I'm actually going to link to a lesson up above where I've previously discussed the cranial nerves if you guys want to watch that. But this nerve controls most of the muscles of facial expression. Now there are different branches, actually five different branches that control different areas, but the temporal branch is typically the one that we're going to be looking to stimulate. Now we can also stimulate the zygomatic branch, but this location is actually much more susceptible to that direct muscle stimulation, sometimes making it hard to differentiate whether we're actually stimulating the nerve. Now the target muscle for the stimulation is actually the corrugator supercilli muscle, and this muscle is located on the inner part of the eyebrow. And stimulation of this muscle causes the inner eyebrow to move downward and medial, causing twitching of that eyebrow. Now for our electrode placement here, the distal lead, again the black negative one, is going to be placed at the outer canthus of the eye. The proximal lead, once again the red positive one, should be placed about two centimeters below at the level of the tragus. And this should also be more posterior, closer to the ear here. And then finally, the last nerve that we can use is actually the posterior tibial nerve. And so as you can see here, this nerve runs along the inner ankle or the medial malleolus, just posterior to the ankle itself, slightly posterior to the location that you'd actually check for the posterior tibial pulse, so just posterior to this artery. Now with this nerve, there's actually very limited risk of direct muscle stimulation. And the muscle that we're looking to stimulate is actually the flexor hallucis brevis muscle. And this causes plantar flexion, so a downward flexion of the great toe. And for our electrode placement here, 
The distal lead, once again the black negative, should be directly on the nerve, just distal to the ankle. And then the proximal lead, so our red positive, should be placed just proximal to the ankle, slightly above the nerve. All right, so now let's actually talk a little bit about our preparation. So when we're choosing a site, we wanna make sure that we are choosing a site that's appropriate and best prepared for the best stimulation. So first off, we wanna make sure there's not too much anasarca or edema, and this can actually reduce the conduction of the stimulus. And because of this fact, over time, the train of form may become less helpful, especially if the sick patient becomes more and more edematous. Now, we also wanna choose a site that's free of any intravenous or arterial arterial lines, as well as any dressings. We do want to avoid any area with any injury or fractures, especially if they have unstable fractures. And then once a site is picked, we do want to ensure that the area is clear of hair, so make sure that you're using clippers to prep the site. Alcohol should also be used to clean and prep the area before we apply the electrodes. And then we want to use gelled electrodes. And so normal ECG electrodes can be used, but they do take up a lot of real estate at our site, but if that's all that you have, those certainly work. Work. Pediatric electrodes for use on adults work great, as well as any smaller specially designed electrodes. And then these electrodes, both the proximal and the distal, need to be at least two and a half centimeters apart. Now, some devices may actually have prongs that can be used on the end of the device, but really when it comes to repeated testing, uh, it may be difficult to ensure that we're always hitting the same spot. If we are utilizing this method, do make sure and mark the location of each prong when you get a good response. And then using the prongs can actually be helpful in initially finding the right location to place our electrodes. Otherwise though, typically we're going to have the wires with the electrode clips that will clip onto the electrodes themselves. Now we do also wanna ensure that our peripheral nerve stimulator device has a new battery and then connect the wires to the electrodes. And the important thing to know here is that the negative Negative, so typically our black lead is going to be our distal lead. And the reason for this is this actually produces a depolarization versus a hyperpolarization of that nerve. The end result of this really is that less stimulation is required to produce an effect. And then finally, we do also want to assess our patient's electrolyte level as things like hypokalemia, hypocalcemia, or hypermagnesemia can impact our testing. All right, so next I wanna talk about a concept that we call supermaximal stimulation. So once we have our site picked and proper placement of our electrodes, we actually need to determine the proper setting for output on our device. This is something that we call supermaximal stimulation. What we're going to be determining here is the maximum output of stimulation where any additional increases no longer cause a stronger response or contraction. And so essentially what this means is that as you increase your output, you'll see stronger and stronger muscle contractions. And we want to find that point where no matter if we go higher with the output, we still get the same strength of contraction. And so there's kind of three different terms that really help to cement the knowledge here. We have threshold versus submaximal versus maximal stimulation. So threshold is really the minimum current required to evoke a muscle contraction. If we are below this level, we're not going to observe any twitching. And this is specifically on patients that have not received any neuromuscular blocking agents yet. And then next we have our submaximal stimulation, which is a stimulation that is not strong enough to elicit full contraction of the muscle fibers. So here we'll observe this as limited twitching of the impacted muscle group. And then finally, we have maximal stimulation. And this one is one that is strong enough to cause full contraction of the muscle. And then what we mean by super maximal is this is actually an increase of 20% over the maximum stimulation. And the point of this is really to provide a cushion to any changes that could impact the effect of our stimulation over time to ensure that we're still delivering a maximal response. So in order to assess for this point, what we wanna do is start at the lowest output in millimeters amps and then perform a train of four. We then increase it by one step, which is usually in increments of five to 10 milliamps. And this is really kind of dependent on the device that you're using and then perform the train of four again. What we're assessing for is if the strength of contraction now is stronger than the previous setting. If it is, then we continue this process, increasing one step at a time and reassessing the contraction each time. Now, some nicer devices do actually have a sensor that we place on the thumb if we're doing the ulnar nerve stimulation. And this actually gives a visual display of the contraction strength. Now, once we get to the next step above where we no longer see a stronger contraction, then we actually wanna leave it here as this is gonna be our 
super maximal stimulation level. And so you could theoretically dial it back one step. Now, this is dependent too on the device that you have. So if you have a very high output and your increases are only five milliamps, then that one step increase might not be at that 20% level. So really you just need to be aware of how much each step is going up for the device that you're using and making sure that once you hit that maximal stimulation that you're 20% above it. Typically though, in a lot of the common devices that we use, this is gonna be one step above the maximal stimulation level. Now, it's very important that we are assessing this before any neuromuscular blockers have been given. I hope this makes sense. If we've already given a paralytic, we're not going to have a true assessment of our patient's contraction. Now, once we determine what this level is for the super maximal stimulation, then we wanna record this. Now, some devices will give you the output in milliamps, while other devices will just have numbers for what step you're on. You can actually see the manual for those to determine what the output is in milliamps and if it's really necessary. Otherwise, just record the level. All right, so with all of that, let's actually talk about the twitch response for our train of four. So once we've started the paralytic infusion, we need to actually assess our patient's response to the train of four. So with each stimulus delivered, we want to assess for twitching at the targeted muscle group. We're going to observe the strength of each twitch as well as if the twitch is present or not. The number and strength of twitches will depend on the amount of blockage that we're getting from our neuromuscular blocker. So in a normal patient with no blockage, we would see four equally strong twitches as I've outlined on this graph here, starting with T1, T2, T3, T4. Now, in fact, patients that do have neuromuscular blocker agents present, but we have less than 65 or 70% of those nicotinic acetylcholine receptors blocked, we're actually gonna see the same thing that we see here, four strong twitches. Now, once we've achieved blockage above this level, then what we actually begin to see is a fade in the twitch response. So here, with each successive twitch, we see slightly less of a response. And this is actually only true for our non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocker agents. If you do want some more information on that, I will link up to a series that I've done talking about these in the past. But here, succinylcholine is the depolarizing neuromuscular blocker agent that we use, and it's not actually one that we use. It's a continuous infusion, so this really isn't gonna be much of a problem here. Now, once we hit around 75% blockage of those receptors, we actually will lose the fourth twitch while we continue to see a decrease in twitch and fading with the other ones that are present. At around 80% blockage, we lose the third twitch. At around 90% blockage, we lose the second twitch, leaving us with just one observable twitch. And then somewhere around 95% blockage, we're actually gonna observe no muscle twitching in response to the train of four. Now, do know that some nicer devices do have a twitch detection sensor and then actually have a graphical display for the responses, which kind of give you these graphs of what I was just showing you, as well as they give you something referred to as the train of four ratio. Now, when it comes to these observable twitches, we're gonna have a goal set for the number of twitches to achieve, and this is usually something around round two. And this is the generally accepted amount of blockage, around 80% that is generally felt to be a good level for our patients. And this too could be in a range. They could have it ordered as something like achieving one to two twitches or two to three twitches, but around two is generally where we keep it. And so what this actually means for us in practice is that if we are above our goal, so meaning we have too many twitches based on the number of twitches observed, then we're actually gonna titrate our medication up in increasing the dose. Then if we're actually below our goal, so we're not seeing enough twitches, then we'd actually titrate our medication down, decreasing the dose. And therefore, hopefully this makes sense on why it's important to determine the super maximal stimulation to really ensure that over time, the twitches observed are meaningful for us. Now, we do wanna be assessing the train of four at least hourly initially, and then every 15 minutes following either any changes in the rate of infusion or any bolus doses given. Now, once 
once we've hit a stable rate without any changes in the infusion and a consistent train of four response, then we can actually increase the interval of testing to up to four hours. But again, bringing that back in if we do have to make any changes or see any changes in our response on the train of four. Now, if you are observing zero of four twitches, so no twitches, especially if this is a big change from where you were and there's no known changes were made to the medication, you really want to ensure that this is accurate. So first off, check the connection of your leads, both at the electrodes as well as to where they plug into your device. Make sure that your battery is good and then change it out if necessary. You do want to make sure that that skin is clean and dry under the electrodes and replace those if necessary. If anisarca or edema is present over time, you may need to actually increase the output in milliamps. And then when in doubt, recheck the train of four at another nerve location. And this is actually where those prongs can come in handy. Ultimately, we want to make sure that if we're saying that they are fully blocked, we want to assess this and make sure that this is actually true because this has implications and we're going to be reducing our medication dose based on this. All right, and that was our review of the peripheral nerve stimulation and our train of four. I really hope that this was some good information for you guys, stuff that you would help to understand what it is that we're doing, why we're doing this, and really kind of help to guide your practice when you have a patient who's on a parallel. So I hope that you guys found this information useful. If you did, please leave me a like on the video down below. Uh, it really helps YouTube know to show this video to other people out there, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave, and I try to respond to as many people as I can. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, and a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you're willing to show me and this channel is truly appreciated, so thank you guys so very much. If you'd be interested in showing additional support for this channel, you can find links to both the YouTube and Patreon membership down below. Head on over there and check out some of the perks that you guys get for doing just that, as well as check out some of the links to other nursing gear, as well as some awesome t-shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release. Otherwise, in the meantime, here's a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.